Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're a lot here. I'm sure there's a lot of interest, so we'll begin immediately. We have until half past three, when then we'll have to give the floor to another press conference. So without any further ado, I'll give the floor immediately to Mr. Voss. Vielen Dank, um, Jean. Thank you, Jean. The first thing I'd like to say is that after weeks of exciting and difficult discussions, my first reaction now is an enormous sense of relief that we finally achieved a result and that the European Parliament has made it clear that we stand shoulder by shoulder with uh, creative people and industries in the European Union while making it clear that they deserve compensation for their efforts. And we've mapped out a way for that. I know that many people who are active on Internet might be frustrated by this result, but I would say to them, however gloomy a picture of this legislation has been painted over the last few days and weeks, it's all an exaggeration. We have created a solid basis to ensure that copyright rules and the digital work can go hand in hand. We've created an effective working basis which will enable member states to implement those provisions. As a result, I sincerely believe that for users, the situation now is far better than it was before. We now have far greater legal certainty as to what is and isn't allowed. And this means that individuals are no longer liable. It's now the platforms who are liable for copyright issues. And we do accept legitimate exceptions and waivers for copy, copyright rule for gifts, memes, remixes and so on. As long as they are legal and authorised, it will be possible to download them to platforms. And that was something which used to be in the power of the platforms to decide, whereas now we as legislators have said clearly, no, you have to permit that. Over and beyond that, we have also created greater legal certainty for individuals in the sense that user-generated content can now be uploaded and there is now a binding provision which would apply to all member states on that. And there is, as I suggest, a binding mechanism which will force all member states to do this. In the past, member states could do this on a voluntary basis, whereas now that is a binding provision applying to all member states. And I would note there again that for individual users, this is most certainly a big improvement. So perhaps now we will have time to talk in a more composed and serene way about these technical issues rather than just focusing on upload filters and the something which won't actually be changed by this reform. Article 13 focuses purely on the need to ensure that platforms provide fair compensation to those whose content they're using. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Asif. Thank you. And uh, I would like uh, to congratulate all of us because uh, this uh, uh, copyright uh, directive was definitely needed for a year. So, in those days, a uh, uh, lot of people, they are discussing just about Article 13, not so much about Article 11 even anymore, but only about Article 13. But I uh, would like to remember to all our people that uh, there are many, many other aspects, and uh, those aspects, uh, they are not less important than uh, Article 13. Well, <coughs> we are thinking about... Uh, uh, artificial intelligence. We have a dream to have leading position globally in, in the field of artificial intelligence. But when one of those important instruments, I'm talking about text and data mining, is not in the hands of our scientists, our entrepreneurs, then how we can have this leading position globally in the field of artificial intelligence? Yes, somebody can say that uh, in meaning of uh, uh, scientific articles based on uh, uh, text and data mining, 
Europe has leading position and others are lagging behind of us. Yes, it's really so, but it's mainly so because of the United Kingdom, where people, scientists and entrepreneurs, they can fully use text and data mining, but sorry to say, in majority of EU member states, scientists, entrepreneurs, they cannot use text and data mining today. Why? Because for text and data mining, you have to make temporary copies. According to existing copyright legislation, to make copies, you have to start with clearing rights. And it's too costly in meaning of administrative costs. So, according to this new directive, people, they can fully use text and data mining. Then, protection of cultural heritage. As we know, our museums and archives, they have millions of hours of uh, digital culture or digital culture <coughs> which is on tapes, VHS tapes, for example. <coughs> and we know at the same time that one day this information will just disappear. It will not last forever. To protect cultural heritage, our museums and archives, they have to make copies from VHS to hard disk, for example. But once again, to make copies, you have to clear rights at first. And when talking just about one hour TV series, this one hour can have 200 different right owners. And my question is, do our museums and archives have enough funds to clear rights with 200 different right owners? I don't think so. What we have to say to, to our museums and archives? This culture which is digital is not a real culture. We don't care about this. I don't think so. Or do we have to say that uh, don't pay any attention on existing copyright legislation. Just protect our cultural heritage, make those copies. Yeah, I don't want to send also that kind of messages. With this new copyright directive, our cultural heritage, which is recorded on tapes, which is digital already today, will protect it, will be protected. Then, Mandatory exception for uh, teaching purposes. So, university professor prepared a really good lecture. He used also some kind of copyright material, some photos. He cleared all the rights, paid three euros per photo, 10, 15 photos, some pieces of music, whatever. It's about, you know, a couple of euros. Now, somebody else, from neighboring country, from another university, says, oh, this was a really good lecture, really impressive. Can you join with us in our university to deliver the same uh, speech or presentation? And then university professor has to think. <coughs> Today's system is based on, um, on principle of territoriality. To clear, once again, rights in this neighboring country. Yes, I have those three years to pay for photo, but uh, it's too costly for me to clear those rights again to visit uh, this uh, university in, in neighboring country. Or if university professor will decide to take a risk not to clear rights, then in the audience, I'm sure there will be somebody who will send a message to tabloid media. And this damage will be destroyed. So, according to new directive, university professors, for teaching purposes, so they can um, use more simple rules and they don't have to be 
afraid because of uh, losing their reputation or for punishment or for whatsoever. So uh, Article 11. See, this was a hot topic some month ago, not anymore. Some people, they were uh, talking about uh, uh, hyperlink tax, but uh, sorry, there is no hyperlink tax. So as we all remember, record labors got to their neighboring rights, 1960s. So press publishers didn't get their neighboring rights last century. What's the difference between record labels and press publishers? There is a huge difference, of course. But in fact, record labels, they invite drummer, singer, somebody who is taking care of what recording to studio. Press publishers, they have to invite photographers, journalists, cameramen, somebody who is taking care about layouts. So, not so big difference. Why those press publishers didn't get uh, their neighboring rights uh, last century already? Because they didn't ask for those <coughs> neighboring rights. Because at that time, it was easier uh, for them to say that uh, let those photographers or journalists will be liable. We are just neutral intermediaries, as platforms say today. So today they are unhappy. According to them, somebody, Google, of course, is using their content without providing a fair remuneration for this. So I hope this Article 11 will create much stronger negotiating positions for our press publishers. And this is definitely needed. So <laughs> Article 11, Art, uh, Article 13, it was discussed already and, and we will continue uh, with those discussions, but um, we have to understand uh, that um, <coughs> this situation we have to, uh, today, it's not uh, uh, favorable when thinking about our authors. As we know, we have two types of platforms. Some platforms are based on subscription. According to McKinsey, they had in the year 2016 212 subscribers. And those 212 people, million people, sorry, million people, they paid to musicians globally 3.9 billion US dollars. Well, musicians, they are not totally happy, but uh, knowing that um, uh, those platforms based on subscription, they are not make, uh, able to make huge profits. Some of them, they are facing with losses. It's somehow <laughs> unpolite to ask for more. Well, they can live with this. But there are some other types of platforms supported by ads. And those platforms had 900 million users in the year 2016. And those 900 million people paid to musicians just 553 million US dollars. And of course, musicians, they are unhappy. Look, we expected to get 15 billion, but now just half a billion. There is a value gap. Well, when consuming electricity, we know how uh, kilowatt hours we consumed uh, uh, during the month, and we have to pill, pay our bills according to this. When consuming drinking water, we know how many cubic meters we consumed during the month. We have to bill, pay our bills according to this. I will conclude very soon. So um, radio stations, they know exactly how many times they had some kind of uh, masterpieces in, in their uh, playlists. <coughs> and authors will be remunerated on basis of that. Libraries, <laughs> the same story. They know exactly how many times people, they took some kind of books. And those authors will get remuneration on basis of that information. Why we have to think that uh, in the internet, some people, they can use uh, uh, content created by somebody else without providing this fair remuneration for this. I don't think it's fair. I think the, this new directive is 
much better than this existing system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Karim, please. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you everybody for joining with us today. Uh, I'd like to start off first of all by uh, acknowledging the tremendous work that has been done by uh, my colleague and friend Axel Voss in getting this file uh, to this particular stage. Uh, I can tell you in 15 years of having been a member of this parliament, I have seen nothing like what we went through on this particular file and, and, and that, that caught me by surprise. I was not expecting this at all. Now, for me personally, I'm just going to add to what's already been said rather than repeat any of that. Uh, but for me, my, my personal priority really was to ensure that um, right holders and creators could actually carry on making a living from their innovation and from their work and their creativity within the creative industries. Uh, and that their exclusive economic rights, <coughs> including communication to the public, were protected. Uh, and one of the things that we've been able to do here is that the responsibility to respect exclusive economic rights shifts from users to the online service providers. Uh, and I know there's been a huge amount of pushback in relation to all of that. But there's one or two general points that I want to make. All of the details of what have been said, I completely agree with all of that. But the fact of the matter is this. The internet is not and cannot be an unregulated space. It has developed in a way that has created a fundamental imbalance that is completely eating away at creativity in the European Union. And what I really fail to understand with so many of the platforms is that actually if you are not going to provide the right circumstances for creativity to, to keep being reborn again and again and again, then ultimately you are finishing yourselves. <laughs> so please stop treating what we are doing here as some sort of attack upon you. It is not. If you look at what we have done, this is in your interests. It is in the interests of the citizens of Europe. It serves all of us. And it, it, it reminded me a little bit, I mean, when we are dealing with trade negotiations here, uh, and quite often you have monopoly interests from traditional industries that have been around for centuries, they behave exactly in the way that we've had to experience here from some platforms, not all, but some. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to highlight this letter, that, this email that we all received uh, regarding Wikipedia. You know, there's a very fine line between <laughs> engaging in the democratic process in order to persuade policymakers to vote or think in a certain way. But actually, when I read that letter, I regarded it as nothing less than sinister. I'm a lawyer by background. I could tell that that letter had been drafted, redrafted, read, proofread, to make sure it was just on the right side of the line. That is unacceptable. And that is why our parliament procedurally pushed back in the way that it did today. And I'm extremely proud that eventually enough colleagues actually protected democracy in this house today. I could carry on to make some more comments in relation to that, I won't. The very last point I want to make is the point that was made by uh, Commissioner Ansip in relation to text and data mining and that my country, of course, within the European Union is a leader on that. At the time we were undertaking the uh, trilogue uh, and negotiations, I made the point in that room that actually we've got to get this right because once the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, you guys are going to find yourselves back here 12 months from now because we simply didn't deal with the issue by grabbing it by the horns. I feel uh, far more comfortable actually saying that half of what I said was hopefully wrong and the United Kingdom is going to be around for quite a long time yet, the way things are going. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Trippel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I do agree with the, uh, what the gentleman said. Because I'm a German MEP and we have the big protests in Germany, I will continue in German. 
Sie alle haben realisiert, dass am Wochenende You've all realized that uh, the demos against Article 30, now Article 17, over the weekend in Germany were pretty major. It was also true in Austria, but less so in other countries. And of course, we take these concerns ser seriously. For many years now, we've been discussing and grappling with these issues. But uh, could I stress very much once again that the point of this reform is that we have uh, appropriate licensing, and we've heard uh, about uh, clarifying rights and so on. And it's not about censorship. And I think there are two different world views. Uh, with the declaration of independence on cyberspace decades ago, uh, it was declared that we know about internet, we know how to access it, and there shouldn't be any rules like you have in the Anagol world. Then there was the safe harbor principle, and uh, that allowed startups to get uh, involved, but they've become monopolies in the meantime. And I think if you have the rule of law and if you want market regulation in the analog world, and that's the internal market, that's a, a regulated market, then you also need to do the same with digital platforms. And I think that's where world views differ. We have different understanding of freedom. Uh, the, the, the pirates uh, want completely unrelated... Uh, uh, platforms and therefore they don't want an upload filter. Now the other side, and I'm part of that other side, want freedom that goes hand in glove with responsibility. And I think we need to make sure that there is a combination of freedom and responsibility. And uh, the data protection reform and what uh, uh, Commissioner Vestager, Vestager is doing and the fact that uh, penalties are in place if people don't uh, play by the rules, how we deal with terror, disinformation and so on, it comes into play. And copyright is part of that overall package where you try to find good rules. It's not about over-regulation, it's not about censorship, it's about a free and fair internet. Thank you. We're really pressed with time, so I'm going to try and group a couple of questions, and then probably we'll have to continue uh, outside. I'm sure that um, our MEPs will be happy to speak more with you outside. Uh, first one there. Any any other questions? So I know already. And another one there. And okay, let's start. Yes, Councillor uh, Gromas, can you just uh, ju just a question uh, to the rapporteur, perhaps, and to the, the vice president of the commission? Um, we hear that there is uh, uh, in, in inside the German government. There are some contrasts. Uh, the Germany has voted in favor of the directive in, in the previous uh, time, but now there is a new vote that has to uh, be uh, performed by the Council. Are you worried that Germany could change the position as Mrs. Reda, who was against uh, the directive, is uh, uh, claiming now, is, saying, is, uh, is uh, calling the Council to, to re-vote, to vote against, and the Germany to vote against. Are you worried about this? Is, is it possible that the, G the German government would change position, perhaps abstain? Okay, and over there. Uh, Ivo Keitsiuri, Era della Sera, something uh, in part related to the question of my colleague. Uh, you, uh, uh, now this directive has to be implemented in the member states. Uh, what is the margin of maneuver that uh, the member states have to clarify the points uh, that are in interpreted in different ways here, and that were at the base of uh, the decision of some group to vote not to the directive that were not on the same side like uh, the multinational company and they were just asking for amendment. I mean, uh, have the country the, the possibility to clarify the text in a way that can have bigger consensus at the national level? Okay. Please, Mr. Voss. Also, zunächst einmal zur Frage der First of all, regarding your question on the German position, I'm not working on the assumption that Germany will change its position again, since it has already made it clear it intends to support the current position. So I find that hard to imagine. However, however, I don't have absolute faith in the result of the vote. vote. But I think if Germany were to change its position, that would be a body blow to all involved. 
as far as implementation is concerned. The fact is, at the European level, we will have just one directive, and that will set out objectives which are binding on all member states. Within that framework, member states are in the, in a, uh, able to decide exactly what direction they intend to go in. It then falls to the Commission to verify whether the implementation plans are compliant with the, uh, the regulation. So there is a great deal of freedom for member states when it comes to pursuing and achieving those objectives. And in all likelihood, there will be positions which simply aren't uh, compatible with the European legislation, but that would, of course, have to be checked. In the meantime, we have to wait to see what direction member states cho choose to go in in terms of implementation. Um, is there, are there any other small questions which we can reply to briefly here? Otherwise, I'd ask you to maybe those who have other questions to come down and you can go out and have a chat and in the back. We have a press release and an FAQ. Some are being distributed uh, in the press room. You'll find more copies uh, in the, in, back in the other press room and, of course, online. Thank you.